Section 1 of The Cruel Painter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ned Troxell. The Cruel Painter by George MacDonald. Section 1. Among the young men assembled at the University of Prague in the year 1590 was one called Karl von Wolkenlicht. A somewhat careless student, he yet held a fair position in the estimation of both professors and men, because he could hardly look at a proposition without understanding it. Where such proposition, however, had to do with anything relating to the deeper insights of the nature, he was quite content that for him it should remain a proposition, which, however, he laid up in one of his mental cabinets, and was ready to reproduce at a moment's notice. This mental agility was more than matched by the corresponding corporeal excellence, and both aided in producing results in which his remarkable strength was equally apparent. In all games depending upon the combination of muscle and skill, he had scarce rivalry enough to keep him in practice. His strength, however, was embodied in such a softness of muscular outline, such a rare Greek-like style of beauty, and associated with such a gentleness of manner and behavior, that partly from the truth of the resemblance, partly from the absurdity of the contrast, he was known throughout the university by the diminutive of the feminine form of his name, and was always called Lotchen. "'I say, Lotchen,' said one of his fellow students, called Richter, across the table in a wine cellar they were in the habit of frequenting, "'do you know Heinrich Hullenrachen here says that he saw this morning, with mortal eyes, whom do you think? Lilith.' "'Adam's first wife?' asked Lutchen, with an attempt at carelessness, while his face flushed like a maiden's. "'None of your chaff,' said Richter. "'Your face is honester than your tongue, and confesses what you cannot deny, that you would give your chance of salvation, a small one to be sure, but all that you've got, for one peep at Lilith, wouldn't you now, Lutchen?' "'Go to the devil,' was all Lutchen's answer to his tormentor. But he turned to Heinrich, to whom the students had given the surname above mentioned because of the enormous width of his jaws, and said with eagerness and envy, disguising them as well as he could under the appearance of curiosity, "'You don't mean it, Heinrich. You have been taking the beggar in. Confess now.' "'Not I. I saw her with my two eyes.' "'Notwithstanding the different planes of their orbits,' suggested Richter." yes notwithstanding the fact that i can get a parallax to any of the fixed stars in a moment with only the breadth of my nose for the base answered heinrich responding at once to the fun and careless of the personal defect insinuated she was near enough for even me to see her perfectly when where how asked lutchen two hours ago in the churchyard of st stephen's by a lucky chance any more little questions, my child? answered Hullenrachen. What could have taken her there, who is seen nowhere? said Richter. She was seated on a grave. After she left, I went to the place, but it was a new-made grave. There was no stone up. I asked the sexton about her. He said he supposed she was the daughter of the woman buried there last Thursday week. I knew it was Lilith. Her mother dead? said Lotchen, musingly. Then he thought with himself, she will be going there again, then. But he took care that this ghost thought should wander unembodied. But how did you know her, Heinrich? You never saw her before. How do you come to be head and ears in love with her, Lotchen, and you haven't seen her at all? interposed Richter. Will you or will you not go to the devil? rejoined Lotchen, with a comic crescendo, to which the other replied with a laugh. "'No one could miss knowing her,' said Heinrich. "'Is she so very like, then?' "'It is always herself, her very self.' A fresh flask of wine, turning out to be not up to the mark, brought the current of the conversation against itself, not much to the dissatisfaction of Lotchen, who had already resolved to be in the churchyard of St. Stephen's at sundown the following day, in the hope that he, too, might be favored with a vision of Lilith. This resolution he carried out, seated in a porch of the church, 
not knowing in what direction to look for the apparition he hoped to see, and desirous as well of not seeming to be on the watch for one, he was gazing at the fallen rose-leaves of the sunset, withering away upon the sky, when glancing aside by an involuntary movement, he saw a woman seated upon a new-made grave, not many yards from where he sat, with her face buried in her hands, and apparently weeping bitterly. Carl was in the shadow of the porch and could see her perfectly, without much danger of being discovered by her, so he sat and watched her. She raised her head for a moment, and the rose flush of the west fell over it, shining on the tears with which it was wet, and giving the whole a bloom which did not belong to it, for it was always pale, and now pale as death. It was indeed the face of Lilith, the most celebrated beauty of Prague. Again she buried her face in her hands, and Carl sat with a strange feeling of helplessness, which grew as he sat, and the longing to help her whom he could not help drew his heart towards her with a trembling reverence which was quite new to him. She wept on. The western roses withered slowly away, and the clouds blended with the sky, and the stars gathered like drops of glory sinking through the vault of night, and the trees about the churchyard grew black, and Lilith almost vanished in the wide darkness. At length she lifted her head, and seeing the night around her, gave a little broken cry of dismay. The minutes had swept over her head, not through her mind, and she did not know that the dark had come. Hearing her cry, Carl rose and approached her. She heard his footsteps, and started to her feet. Carl spoke. Do not be frightened, he said. Let me see you home. I will walk behind you. Who are you? she rejoined. Carl Volkenlicht. I have heard of you, thank you, I can go home alone. Yet, as if in a half-dreamy, half-unconscious mood, she accepted his offered hand to lead her through the graves, and allowed him to walk beside her till, reaching the corner of a narrow street, she suddenly bade him good-night and vanished. He thought it better not to follow her, so he returned her good-night and went home. How to see her again was his first thought the next day, as, in fact, how to see her at all had been his first thought for many days. She went nowhere that ever he heard of. She knew nobody that he knew. She was never seen at church or at market, never seen in the street. Her home had a dreary, desolate aspect. It looked as if no one ever went out or in. It was like a place on which decay had fallen, because there was no indwelling spirit. The mud of years was baked upon its door, and no faces looked out of its dusty windows. How, then, could she be the most celebrated beauty of Prague? How, then, was it that Heinrich Höllenrachen knew her the moment he saw her? Above all, how was it that Karl Wolkenlicht had, in fact, fallen in love with her before he ever saw her? It was thus. Her father was a painter. Belonging thus to the public, it had taken the liberty of renaming him. Everyone called him Teufelsburst, or Devil's Brush. It was a name with which, to judge from the nature of his representations, he could hardly fail to be pleased. For, not as a nightmare dream, which may alternate with the loveliest visions, but as his ordinary, everyday work, he delighted to represent human suffering. Not an aspect of human woe or torture, as expressed in countenance or limb, came before his willing imagination, but he bore it straightway to his easel. In the moments that precede sleep, when the black space before the eyes of the poet teems with lovely faces, or dawns into a spirit landscape, face after face of suffering, in all varieties of expression, would crowd as if compelled by the accompanying fiends to present themselves in awful levy before the inner eye of the expectant master. Then he would rise, light his lamp, and with rapid hand make notes of his visions, recording with swift successive sweeps of his pencil every individual face which had rejoiced his evil fancy. Then he would return to his couch, and, well satisfied, fall asleep to dream yet further embodiments of human ill. What wrong could man or mankind have done him? 
to be thus fearfully pursued by the vengeance of the artist's hate. Another characteristic of the faces and form which he drew was that they were all beautiful in the original idea. The lines of each face, however distorted by pain, would have been, in rest, absolutely beautiful, and the whole of the execution bore witness to the fact that upon this original beauty the painter had directed the artillery of anguish to bring down the sky-soaring heights of its divinity to the level of a hated existence. To do this he worked in perfect accordance with artistic law, falsifying no line of the original forms. It was the suffering, rather than his pencil, that wrought the change. The latter was the willing instrument to record what the imagination conceived, with a cruelty composed enough to be correct. To enhance the beauty he had thus distorted, and so to enhance yet further the suffering that produced the distortion, he would often represent attendant demons, whom he made as ugly as his imagination could compass, avoiding, however, all grotesqueness beyond what was sufficient to indicate that they were demons and not men. Their ugliness rose from hate, envy, and all evil passions, amongst which he especially delighted to represent a gloating exultation over human distress, and often in the midst of his clouds of demon faces would some one who knew him recognize the painter's own likeness, such as the mirror might have presented it to him when he was busiest over the incarnation of some exquisite torture. But apparently, with the wish to avoid being supposed to choose such representations for their own sakes, he always found a story, often in the histories of the church, whose name he gave to the painting, and which he pretended to have inspired the pictorial conception. No one, however, who looked upon his suffering martyrs, could suppose for a moment that he honored their martyrdom. They were but the vehicles for his hate of humanity. He was the torturer, and not Diocletian or Nero. But, stranger yet to tell, there was no picture, whatever its subject, into which he did not introduce one form of placid and harmonious loveliness. In this, however, his fierceness was only more fully displayed, for in no case did this form manifest any relation either to the actors or the endurers in the picture. Hence its very loveliness became almost hateful to those who beheld it. Not a shade crossed the still sky of that brow, not a ripple disturbed the still sea of that cheek. She did not hate, she did not love the sufferers. The painter would not have her hate, for that would be to the injury of her loveliness, would not have her love, for he hated. Sometimes she floated above as a still, unobservant angel, her gaze turned upward, dreaming along, careless as a white summer cloud across the blue. If she looked down on the scene below, it was only that the beholder might see that she saw and did not care, that not a feather of her outspread pinions would quiver at the sight. Sometimes she would stand in the crowd, as if she had been copied there from another picture, and had nothing to do with this one, nor any right to be in it at all. Or when the red blood was trickling drop by drop from the crushed limb, she might be seen standing nearest, smiling over a primrose, or the bloom on a peach. Some had said that she was the painter's wife, that she had been false to him, that he had killed her, and, finding that was no sufficing revenge, thus half in love, and half in deepest hate, immortalized his vengeance. But it was now universally understood that it was his daughter, of whose loveliness extravagant reports went abroad, though all said, doubtless reading this from her father's pictures, that she was a beauty without a heart. Strange theories of something else supplying its place were rife among the anatomical students. With the girl in the pictures, the wild imagination of Lottchen, probably in part from her apparently absolute unattainableness and her undisputed heartlessness, had fallen in love, as far as the mere imagination can fall in love. But again, how was he to see her? He haunted the house night after night, 
those blue eyes never met his. No step responsive to his came from that door. It seemed to have been so long unopened that it had grown as fixed and hard as the stones that held its bolts in their passive clasp. He dared not watch in the daytime, and with all his watching at night, he never saw father or daughter or domestic cross the threshold. Little he thought that, from a shot window near the door, a pail of blue eyes, like Lilith's, but paler and colder, were watching him, just as a spider watches the fly that is likely, ere long, to fall into his toils. And into those toils Carl soon fell. For her form darkened the page, her form stood on the threshold of sleep, and when, overcome with watching, he did enter its precincts, her form entered with him, and walked by his side. He must find her, or the world might go to the bottomless pit for him. But how? Yes, he would be a painter. Teufelsburst would receive him as a humble apprentice. He would grind his colors, and Teufelsburst would teach him the mysteries of the science, which is the handmaiden of art. Then he might see her, and that was all his ambition. In the clear morning light of a day in autumn, when the leaves were beginning to fall seared from the hand of that death, which has his dance in the chapels of nature as well as in the cathedral aisles of men, he walked up and knocked at the dingy door. The spider painter opened it himself. He was a little man, meager and pallid, with those faded blue eyes, a low nose in three distinct divisions, and thin, curveless, cruel lips. He wore no hair on his face, but long gray locks, long as a woman's, were scattered over his shoulders and hung down on his breast. When Wolkenlicht had explained his errand, he smiled a smile in which hypocrisy could not hide the cunning, and, after many difficulties, consented to receive him as a pupil, on condition that he would become an inmate of his house. Wolkenlicht's heart bounded with delight, which he tried to hide. The second smile of Teufelsburst might have shown him that he had ill succeeded. The fact that he was not a native of Prague, but coming from a distant part of the country was entirely his own master in the city, rendered this condition perfectly easy to fulfill. And that very afternoon he entered the studio of Teufelsburst as his scholar and servant. It was a great room, filled with the appliances and results of art. Many pictures, festooned with cobwebs, were hung carelessly on the dirty walls. Others, half-finished, leaned against them on the floor. Several, in different stages of progress, stood upon easels. But all spoke the cruel bent of the artist's genius. In one corner, a lay figure was extended on a couch, covered with a pall of black velvet. Through its folds, the form beneath was easily discernible, and one hand and forearm protruded from beneath it at right angles to the rest of the frame. Lutchen could not help shuddering when he saw it, Although he overcame the feeling in a moment, he felt a great repugnance to seating himself with his back towards it, as the arrangement of an easel, at which Teufelsborst wished him to draw, rendered necessary. He contrived to edge himself round, so that when he lifted his eyes, he should see the figure, and be sure it could not rise without his being aware of it. But his master saw, and understood his altered position, and under some pretense about the light, compelled him to resume the position in which he had placed him at first, after which he sat watching, over the top of his picture, the expression of his countenance as he tried to draw, reading in it the horrid fancy that the figure under the pall had risen, and was stealthily approaching to look over his shoulder. But Lutchen resisted the feeling, and, being already no contemptible draughtsman, was soon interested enough to forget it, and then, any moment, she might enter. Now began a system of slow torture, for the chance of which the painter had been long on the watch, especially since he had first seen Karl lingering about the house. 
his opportunities of seeing physical suffering were nearly enough, even for the diseased necessities of his art. But now he had one in his power, on whom, his own will fettering him, he could try any experiments he pleased for the production of a kind of suffering, in the observation of which he did not consider that he had yet sufficient experience. He would hold the very heart of the youth in his hand, and wring it and torture it to his own content. And lest Karl should be strong enough to prevent those expressions of pain for which he lay on the watch, he would make use of further means, known to himself, and known to few besides. All that day Karl saw nothing of Lilith, but he heard her voice once, and that was enough for one day. The next, she was sitting to her father the greater part of the day, and he could see her as often as he dared glance up from his drawing. She had looked at him when she entered, but had shown no sign of recognition, and all day long she took no further notice of him. He hoped at first that this came of the intelligence of love, but he soon began to doubt it, for he saw that, with the holy shadow of sorrow, all that distinguished the expression of her countenance from that which the painter so constantly reproduced had vanished likewise. It was the very face of the unheeding angel, whom, as often as he lifted his eyes higher than hers, he saw on the wall above her, playing on a psaltery in the smoke of the torment ascending for ever from burning Babylon. The power of the painter had not merely wrought for the representation of the woman of his imagination. It had had scope as well in realizing her. Carl soon began to see that communication, other than of the eyes, was all but hopeless, and to any attempt in that way she seemed altogether indisposed to respond. Nor, if she had wished it, would it have been safe, for as often as he glanced toward her, instead of hers, he met the blue eyes of the painter gleaming upon him like winter lightning. His tones, his gestures, his words seemed kind. His glance and his smile refused to be disguised. The first day he dined alone in the studio, waited upon by an old woman. The next he was admitted to the family table, with Teufelsburst and Lilith. The room offered a strange contrast to the study. As far as handicraft, directed by a sumptuous taste, could construct a house paradise, this was one but it seemed rather a paradise of demons, for the walls were covered with Teufelsburst's paintings. During the dinner, Lilith's gaze scarcely met that of Wolkenlicht, and once or twice, when their eyes did meet, her glance was so perfectly unconcerned that Karl wished he might look at her forever without the fear of her looking at him again. She seemed like one whose love had rushed out glowing with seraphic fire, to be frozen to death in more than wintry cold. She now walked lonely without her love. In the evenings he was expected to continue his drawing by lamplight, and at night he was conducted by Teufelsburst to his chamber. Not once did he allow him to proceed thither alone, and not once did he leave him there without locking and bolting the door on the outside. But he felt nothing except the coldness of Lilith. Day after day she sat to her father in every variety of costume that could best show the variety of her beauty. How much greater that beauty might be if it ever blossomed into a beauty of soul, Wolkenlicht never imagined, for he soon loved her enough to attribute to her all the possibilities of her face as actual possessions of her being. To account for everything that seemed to contradict this perfection, his brain was prolific in inventions till he was compelled at last to see that she was in the condition of a rosebud, which, on the point of blossoming, had been chilled into a changeless bud by the cold of an untimely frost. For one day, after the father and daughter had become a little more accustomed to his silent presence, a conversation began between them, which went on until he saw that Teufelsburst believed in nothing except his art. How much of his feeling for that could be dignified by the name of belief, seeing its objects were such as they were, might have been questioned. 
it seemed to Wolkenlicht to amount only to this, that amidst a thousand distastes, it was a pleasant thing to reproduce on the canvas the forms he beheld around him, modifying them to express the prevailing feelings of his own mind. A more desolate communication between souls than that which then passed between father and daughter could hardly be imagined. The father spoke of humanity and all its experiences in a tone of the bitterest scorn. He despised men and himself amongst them, and rejoiced to think that the generations rose and vanished, brood after brood, as the crops of corn grew and disappeared. Lilith, who listened to it all unmoved, taking only an intellectual interest in the question, remarked that even the corn had more life than that, for, after its death, it rose again in the new crop. Whether she meant that the corn was therefore superior to man, forgetting that the superior can produce being without losing its own, or only advanced an objection to her father's argument, Wolkenlicht could not tell. But Teufelsburst laughed like the sound of a saw, and said, Follow out the analogy, my Lilith, and you will see that man is like the corn that springs again after it is buried. But unfortunately the only result we know of is a vampire. Wolkenlicht looked up, and saw a shudder pass through the frame and over the pale thin face of the painter. This he could not account for, but Teufelsburst could have explained it for there were strange whispers abroad, and they had reached his ear, and his philosophy was not quite enough for them. But the laugh with which Lilith met this frightful attempt at wit grated dreadfully on Wolkenlicht's feeling. With her, too, however, a reaction seemed to follow, for, turning round a moment after, and looking at the picture on which her father was working, the tears rose in her eyes, and she said, Oh, father, how like my mother you have made me this time. Child, retorted the painter with a cold fierceness, you have no mother. That which is gone out is gone out. Put no name in my hearing on that which is not. Where no substance is, how can there be a name? Lilith rose and left the room. Wolkenlicht now understood that Lilith was a frozen bud, and could not blossom into a rose. But pure love lives by faith. It loves the vaguely beheld and unrealized ideal. It dares believe that the loved is not all that she ever seemed. It is in virtue of this that love loves on. And it was in virtue of this that Wolkenlicht loved Lilith yet more after he discovered what a grave of misery her unbelief was digging for her within her own soul. For her sake he would bear anything, bear even with calmness the torments of his own love. He would stay on, hoping and hoping. The text, that we know not what a day may bring forth, is just as true of good things as of evil things, and out of time's womb the facts must come. But with the birth of this resolution to endure, his suffering abated, his face grew more calm, his love, no less earnest, was less imperious, and he did not look up so often from his work when Lilith was present. The master could see that his pupil was more at ease, and that he was making rapid progress in his art. This did not suit his designs, and he would betake himself to his further schemes. For this purpose he proceeded first to simulate a friendship for Wolkenlicht, the manifestations of which he gradually increased until, after a day or two, he asked him to drink wine with him in the evening. Karl readily agreed. The painter produced some of his best, but took care not to allow Lilith to taste it, for he had cunningly prepared and mingled with it a decoction of certain herbs and other ingredients, exercising specific actions upon the brain, and tending to the inordinate excitement of those portions of it which are principally under the rule of the imagination. By the reaction of the brain during the operation of these stimulants, 
the imagination is filled with suggestions and images. The nature of these is determined by the prevailing mood of the time. They are such as the imagination would produce of itself, but increased in number and intensity. Teufelsborst, without philosophizing about it, called his preparation simply a love filter, a concoction well known by name, but the composition of which was the secret of only a few. Wolkenlicht had, of course, not the least suspicion of the treatment to which he was subjected. Teufelsborst was, however, doomed to fresh disappointment. Not that his potion failed in the anticipated effect, for now Karl's real sufferings began, but that such was the strength of Karl's will, and his fear of doing anything that might give a pretext for banishing him from the presence of Lilith, that he was able to conceal his feelings far too successfully for the satisfaction of Teufelsburst's art. Yet he had to fetter himself with all the restraints that self-exhortation could load him with, to refrain from falling at the feet of Lilith, and kissing the hem of her garment. For that, as the lowliest part of all that surrounded her, itself kissing the earth, seemed to come nearest within the reach of his ambition, and therefore to draw him the most. No doubt the painter had experience and penetration enough to perceive that he was suffering intensely, but he wanted to see the suffering embodied in outward signs, bringing it within the region over which his pencil held sway. He kept on, therefore, trying one thing after another, and rousing the poor youth to agony, till to his other sufferings were added, at length, those of failing health, a fact which noted itself evidently enough even for Teufelsburst, though its signs were not of the sort he chiefly desired. But Karl endured all bravely. Meantime, for various reasons, he scarcely ever left the house. End of section one. Section two of The Cruel Painter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ned Troxell. The Cruel Painter by George MacDonald. Section 2. I must now interrupt the course of my story to introduce another element. A few years before the period of my tale, a certain shoemaker of the city had died under circumstances more than suggestive of suicide. He was buried, however, with such precautions that six weeks elapsed before the rumor of the facts broke out. Upon which rumor, not before, the most fearful reports began to be circulated, supported by what seemed to the people of Prague incontestable evidence. A spectrum of the deceased appeared to multitudes of persons, playing horrible pranks and occasioning indescribable consternation throughout the whole town. This went on till at last, about eight months after his burial, the magistrates caused his body to be dug up, when it was found in just the condition of the bodies of those who in the eastern countries of Europe are called vampires. They buried the corpse under the gallows, but neither the digging up nor the reburying were of avail to banish the spectre. Again the spade and pickaxe were set to work, and the dead man being found considerably improved in condition since his last interment, was, with various horrible indignities, burnt to ashes, after which the spectrum was never seen more. And a second epidemic of the same nature had broken out a little before the period to which I have brought my story. About midnight, after a calm, frosty day, for it was now winter, a terrible storm of wind and snow came on. The tempest howled frightfully about the house of the painter, and Wolkenlicht found some solace in listening to the uproar, for his troubled thoughts would not allow him to sleep. It raged on all the next three days, till about noon on the fourth day, when it suddenly fell and all was calm. The following night, Wolkenlicht, lying awake, heard unaccountable noises in the next house, as of things thrown about, of kicking and fighting horses, and of opening and shutting gates. Flinging wide his lattice and looking out, 
The noise of howling dogs came to him from every quarter of the town. The moon was bright, and the air was still. In a little while he heard the sounds of a horse going at full gallop round the house, so that it shook as if it would fall, and the flashes of light shone into his room. How much of this may have been owing to the effect of the drugs on poor Luchin's brain, I leave my readers to determine. But when the family met at breakfast in the morning, Teufelsburst, who had been already out of doors, reported that he had found the marks of strange feet in the snow, all about the house and through the garden at the back, stating as his belief that the tracks must be continued over the roofs, for there was no passage otherwise. And there was a wicked gleam in his eye as he spoke and Lilith believed that he was only trying an experiment on Carl's nerves. He persisted that he had never seen any footprints of the sort before. Carl informed him of his experiences during the night, upon which Teufelsburst looked a little graver still, and proceeded to tell them that the storm, whose snow was still covering the ground, had arisen the very moment their next-door neighbor died, and had ceased as suddenly the moment he was buried though it had raved furiously all the time of the funeral, so that it made men's bodies quake and their teeth chatter in their heads. Carl had heard that the man, whose name was John Kuntz, was dead and buried. He knew that he had been a very wealthy, and therefore most respectable, alderman of the town. He had been very fond of horses, and he had died in consequence of a kick received from one of his own, as he was looking at his hoof but he had not heard that, just before he died, a black cat opened the casement with her nails, ran to his bed, and violently scratched his face and the bolster, as if she endeavored by force to remove him out of the place where he lay. But the cat afterwards was suddenly gone, and she was no sooner gone, but he breathed his last. So said Teufelsborst, as the reporter of the town talk. Lilith looked very pale and terrified and it was perhaps owing to this that the painter brought no more tales home with him. There were plenty to bring, but he heard them all and said nothing. The fact was that the philosopher himself could not resist the infection of the fear that was literally raging in the city, and perhaps the reports that he himself had sold himself to the devil had sufficient response from his own evil conscience to add to the influence of the epidemic upon him. The whole place was infested with the presence of the dead Kuntz, till scarce a man or woman would dare to be alone. He strangled old men, insulted women, squeezed children to death, knocked out the brains of dogs against the ground, pulled up posts, turned milk into blood, nearly killed a worthy clergyman by breathing upon him the intolerable airs of the grave, cold and malignant and noisome, and, in short, filled the city with a perfect madness of fear so that every report was believed without the smallest doubt or investigation. Though Teufelsborst brought home no more of the town talk, the old servant was a faithful purveyor, and frequented the news-mart assiduously. Indeed, she had some nightmare experiences of her own that she was proud to add to the stock of horrors which the city enjoyed with such a hearty community of goods. For those regions were not far removed from the birthplace and home of the vampire. The belief in vampires is the quintessential concentration and embodiment of all the passion of fear in Hungary and the adjacent regions. Nor, of all the other inventions of the human imagination, has there ever been one so perfect in crawling terror as this. Lilith and Karl were quite familiar with the popular ideas on the subject. It did not require to be explained to them that a vampire was a body retaining a kind of animal life after the soul had departed. If any relation existed between it and the vanished ghost, it was only sufficient to make it restless in its grave. Possessed of vitality enough to keep it uncorrupted and pliant, its only instinct was a blind hunger for the sole food which could keep its awful life persistent, living human blood. Hence it, or if not it, a sort of semi-material exhalation or essence of it, retaining its form and material relations, crept from its tomb and went roaming about till it found some one asleep, towards whom it had an attraction founded on old affection. It sucked the blood of this unhappy being, transferring so much of its life to itself as a vampire could assimilate. 
death was the certain consequence. If suspicion conjectured aright, and they opened the proper grave, the body of the vampire would be found perfectly fresh and plump, sometimes indeed of rather florid complexion, with grown hair, eyes half open, and the stains of recent blood about its greedy, leech-like lips. Nothing remained but to consume the corpse to ashes, upon which the vampire would show itself no more. But what added infinitely to the horror was the certainty that whoever died from the mouth of the vampire, wrinkled grandsire or delicate maiden, must in turn rise from the grave and go forth a vampire to suck the blood of the dearest left behind. This was the generation of the vampire brood. Lilith trembled at the very name of the creature. Carl was too much in love to be afraid of anything. Yet the evident fear of the unbelieving painter took a hold of his imagination, and under the influence of the potions, of which he still partook unwittingly, when he was not thinking about Lilith, he was thinking about the vampire. Meantime, the conditions of things in the painter's household continued much the same for Wolkenlicht. Work all day, no communication between the young people, the dinner and the wine, silent reading when work was done, with stolen glances many over the top of the book, glances that were never returned, the cold good night, the locking of the door, the wakeful night and the drowsy morning, but at length a change came, and sooner than any of the party had expected. For whether it was that the impatience of Teufelsburst had urged him to yet more dangerous experiments, or that the continuance of those he had been so long employing had overcome at length the vitality of Wolkenlicht, one afternoon, as he was sitting at his work, he suddenly dropped from his chair, and his master, hurrying to him in some alarm, found him rigid and apparently lifeless. Lilith was not in the study when this took place. In justice to Teufelsburst, it must be confessed that he employed all the skill he was a master of, which for beneficent purposes was not very great, to restore the youth, but without avail. At last, hearing the footsteps of Lilith, he desisted in some consternation, and that she might escape being shocked by the sight of a dead body where she had been accustomed to see a living one, he removed the lay figure from the couch, and laid Carl in its place, covering him with a black velvet pall. He was just in time. She started at seeing no one in Carl's place, and said, "'Where is your pupil, father?' "'Gone home,' he answered with a kind of convulsive grin. She glanced round the room, caught sight of the lay figure where it had not been before, looked at the couch, and saw the pall yet heaved up from beneath, opened her eyes till the entire white sweep around the iris suggested a new expression of consternation to Teufelsborst though from a quarter whence he did not desire or look for it, and then, without a word, sat down to a drawing she had been busy upon the day before. But her father, glancing at her now, as Wolkenlicht had used to do, could not help seeing that she was frightfully pale. She showed no other signs of uneasiness. As soon as he released her, she withdrew, with one more glance as she passed, at the couch and the figure blocked out in black upon it. She hastened to her chamber, shut and locked the door, sat down on the side of the couch, and fell, not a weeping, but a thinking. Was he dead? What did it matter? They would all be dead soon. Her mother was dead already. It was only that the earth could not bear more children except she devoured those to whom she had already given birth. But what if they had to come back in another form and live another sad, hopeless, loveless life over again? And so she went on questioning, and receiving no replies, while through all her thoughts passed and repassed the eyes of Wolkenlicht, which she had so often felt to be upon her when she did not see them, wild with repressed longing, the light of their love shining through the veil of diffused tears, ever gathering and never overflowing. Then came the pale face, so worshipping, so distant in its self-withdrawn devotion, slowly dawning out of the vapours of her reverie. When it vanished, she tried to see it again. It would not come when she called it. But when her thoughts left knocking at the door of the lost, and wandered away, out came the pale, troubled, silent face again, gathering itself up from some unknown nook in her world of fantasy. And once more, when she tried to steady it by the fixedness of her regard, fading back into the mist. 
so the phantasm of the dead drew near and wooed as the living had never dared what if there were any good in loving what if men and women did not all die out but some dim shade of each like that pale mind-ghost of wolkenlicht floated through the eternal vapours of chaos and what if they might sometimes cross each other's path meet know they had met love on would not that revive the withered memory fix the fleeting ghost give a new habitation a body even to the poor unhoused wanderers frozen by the eternal frosts no longer thinking beings but thoughts wandering through the brain of the melancholy mass back with the thought came the face of the dead carl and the maiden threw herself on her bed in a flood of bitter tears she could have loved him if he had only lived she did love him for he was dead but even in the midst of the remorse that followed for had not she killed him life seemed a less hard and hopeless thing than before for it is love itself and not its responses or results that is the soul of life and its pleasures two hours passed ere she could again show herself to her father from whom she seemed in some new way divided by the new feeling in which he did not and could not share but at last lest he should seek her and finding her should suspect her thoughts she descended and sought him for there is a maidenliness in sorrow that wraps her garments close around her but he was not to be seen the door of the study was locked a shudder passed through her as she thought of what her father who lost no opportunity of furthering his all but perfect acquaintance with the human form and structure might be about with a figure which she knew lay dead beneath that velvet pall but which had risen to haunt the hollow caves and cells of her living brain she rushed away and up once more to her silent room through the darkness which had now settled down in the house threw herself again on her bed and lay almost paralyzed with horror and distress but teufelsburst was not about anything so frightful as she supposed though something frightful enough i have already implied that wolkenlicht was in form as fine an embodiment of youthful manhood as any old greek republic could have provided one of its sculptors with as model for an apollo it is true that to the eye of a greek artist he would not have been more acceptable in consequence of the regimen he had been going through for the last few weeks but the emaciation of wolkenlicht's frame and the consequent prominence of the muscles indicating the pain he had gone through were peculiarly attractive to teufelsburst he was busy preparing to take a cast of the body of his dead pupil that it might aid to the perfection of his future labors he was deep in the artistic enjoyment of a form at the same time so beautiful and strong yet with the lines of suffering in every limb and feature when his daughter's hand was laid on the latch he started flung the velvet drapery over the body and went to the door but lilith had vanished he returned to his labors the operation took a long time for he performed it very carefully towards midnight he had finished encasing the body in a close clinging shell of plaster which when broken off and fitted together would be the matrix to the form of the dead Wolkenlicht. before leaving it to harden till the morning he was just proceeding to strengthen it with an additional layer all over when a flash of lightning reflected in all its dazzle from the snow without almost blinded him a peal of long-drawn thunder followed the wind rose and just such a storm came on as had risen some time before the death of kuntz whose spectre was still tormenting the city the gnomes of terror deep hidden in the caverns of teufelsburst's nature broke out jubilant with trembling hands he tried to cast the pall over the awful white chrysalis failed and fled to his chamber and there lay the studio naked to the eyes of the lightning with its tortured forms throbbing out of the dark and quivering as with life in the almost continuous palpitations of the light while on the couch lay the motionless mass of whiteness gleaming blue in the lightning almost more terrible in its crude indications of the human form than that which it enclosed it lay there as if dropped from some tree of chaos haggard with the snows of eternity a huge misshapen nut with a corpse for its kernel but the lightning would soon have revealed a more terrible sight still had there been any eyes to behold it at midnight while a peal of thunder was just dying away in the distance the crust of death flew asunder rending in all directions and pale as his investiture glaring with ghastly eyes the form of karl started up sitting on the couch had he not been far beyond ordinary men in strength 
he could not have thus rent his sepulchre. Indeed, had Teufelsborst been able to finish his task by the additional layer of gypsum which he contemplated, he must have died the moment life revived, although, so long as the trance lasted, neither the exclusion from the air nor the practical solidification of the walls of his chest could do him any injury. He had lain unconscious throughout the operations of Teufelsborst, but now the catalepsy had passed away, possibly under the influence of the electric condition of the atmosphere. Very likely the strength he now put forth was intensified by a convulsive reaction of all the powers of life, as is not infrequently the case in sudden awakenings from similar interruptions of vital activity. The coming to himself and the bursting of his case were simultaneous. He sat staring about him, with, of all his mental faculties, only his imagination awake, from which the thoughts that occupied it when he fell senseless had not yet faded. These thoughts had been compounded of feelings about Lilith, and the speculations about the vampire that haunted the neighborhood, and the fumes of the last drug of which he had partaken, still hovering in his brain, combined with these thoughts and fancies to generate the delusion that he had just broken from the embrace of his coffin, and risen, the last born of the vampire race. The sense of unavoidable obligation to fulfill his doom was yet mingled with a faint flutter of joy, for he knew that he must go to Lilith. With a deep sigh, he rose, gathered up the pall of black velvet, flung it around him, stepped from the couch, and left the study to find her. Meantime, Teufelsburst had sufficiently recovered to remember that he had left the door of the studio unfastened, and that any one entering would discover in what he had been engaged, which, in the case of his getting into any difficulty about the death of Karl, would tell powerfully against him. He was at the farther end of a long passage, leading from the house to the studio, on his way to make all secure, when Karl appeared at the door, and advanced toward him. The painter, seized with invincible terror, turned and fled. He reached his room, and fell senseless on the floor. The phantom held on its way, heedless. Lilith, on gaining her room the second time, had thrown herself on her bed as before, and had wept herself into a troubled slumber. She lay dreaming, and dreadful dreams. Suddenly she awoke in one of those peals of thunder which tormented the high regions of the air as a storm billows the surface of the ocean. She lay awake and listened. As it died away, she thought she heard, mingling with its last muffled murmurs, the sound of moaning. She turned her face towards the room in keen terror, but she saw nothing. Another light, long-drawn sigh reached her ear, and at the same moment a flash of lightning illumined the room. In the corner farthest from her bed she spied a white face, nothing more. She was dumb and motionless with fear. Utter darkness followed, a darkness that seemed to enter her very brain. Yet she felt that the face was slowly crossing the black gulf of the room, and drawing near to where she lay. The next flash revealed, as it bended over her, the ghastly face of Karl, down which flowed fresh tears. The rest of his form was lost in blackness. Lilith did not faint, but it was the very force of her fear that seemed to keep her alive. It became for the moment the atmosphere of her life. She lay trembling and staring at the spot in the darkness where she supposed the face of Karl still to be. But the next flash showed her the face far off, looking at her through the panes of her lattice window. For Lottchen, as soon as he saw Lilith, seemed to himself to go through a second stage of awaking. Her face made him doubt whether he could be a vampire after all, for, instead of wanting to bite her arm and suck the blood, he all but fell down at her feet in a passion of speechless love. The next moment he became aware that his presence must be at least very undesirable to her, and in an instant he had reached her window, which he knew looked upon a lower roof that extended between the two different parts of the house, and before the next flash came he had stepped through the lattice and closed it behind him. Believing his own room to be attainable from this quarter, he proceeded along the roof in the direction he judged best. The cold winter air by degrees restored him entirely to his right mind, and he soon comprehended the whole of the circumstances in which he found himself. Peeping through a window he was passing, to see whether it belonged to his room, he spied Teufelsborst who, at the very moment, was lifting his head from the faint into which he had fallen at the first sight of Lottchen. The moon was shining clear, and in its light the painter saw, to his horror, the pale face staring in at his window. He thought it had been there ever since he had fainted, 
and dropped again in a deeper swoon than before. Carl saw him fall, and the truth flashed upon him, that the wicked artist took him for what he had believed himself to be when he first recovered from his trance, namely the vampire of the former Karl Wolkenlicht. The moment he comprehended it, he resolved to keep up the delusion if possible. Meantime, he was innocently preparing a new ingredient for the popular dish of horrors to be served at the ordinary of the city the next day, for the old servants were not the only eyes that had seen him besides those of Teufelsborst. What could be more like a vampire dragging his pall after him than this apparition of poor, half-frozen Lottchen crawling across the roof? Karl remembered afterwards that he had heard the dogs howling awfully in every direction as he crept along, but this was hardly necessary to make those who saw him conclude that it was the same phantasm of John Kuntz which had been infesting the whole city, and especially the house next door to the painters, which had been the dwelling of the respectable aldermen, who had degenerated into this most disreputable of moneyless vagabonds. What added to the consternation of all who heard of it was the sickening conviction that the extreme measures which they had resorted to in order to free the city from the ghoul, beyond which nothing could be done, had been utterly unavailing, successful as they had proved in every other known case of the kind. For, urged as well by various horrid signs about his grave, which not even its close proximity to the altar could render a place of repose, they had opened it, had found in the body every peculiarity belonging to a vampire, had pulled it out with the greatest difficulty on account of a quite supernatural ponderosity, which rendered the horse which had killed him, a strong animal, all but unable to drag it along, and had at last, after cutting it in pieces, and expending on the fire two hundred and sixteen great billets, succeeded in conquering its incombustibleness, and reducing it to ashes. Such, at least, was the story which had reached the painter's household, and was believed by many, and if all this did not compel the perturbed corpse to rest, what more could be done? When Karl had reached his room, and was dressing himself, the thought struck him that something might be made of the report of the extreme weight of the body of old Kuntz, to favor the continuance of the delusion of Teufelsburst, although he hardly knew yet to what use he could turn this delusion. He was convinced that he would have made no progress however long he might have remained in his house, and that he would have more chance of favor with Lilith if he were to meet her in any other circumstances whatever than those in which he invariably saw her, namely, surrounded by her father's influences and watched by her father's cold blue eyes. As soon as he was dressed, he crept down to the studio, which was now quiet enough, the storm being over, and the moon filling it with her steady shine. In the corner lay in all directions the fragments of the mould which his own body had formed and filled. The bag of plaster and the bucket of water which the painter had been using stood beside. Lottchen gathered all the pieces together, and then making his way to an outhouse where he had seen various odds and ends of rubbish lying, chose from the heap as many pieces of old iron and other metal as he could find. To these he added a few large stones from the garden. When he had got all into the studio, he locked the door, and proceeded to fit together the parts of the mould, filling up the hollow as he went with the heaviest things he could get into it, and solidifying the hole by pouring in plaster, till, having at length completed it, and obliterated as much as possible the marks of joining, he left it to harden, with the conviction that now it would make a considerable impression on Teufelsburst's imagination, as well as on his muscular sense. He then left everything else as nearly undisturbed as he could, and, knowing all the ways of the house, was soon in the street without leaving any signs of his exit. End of section two. Section three of The Cruel Painter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ned Troxell. The Cruel Painter by George MacDonald. Section 3. Karl soon found himself before the house in which his friend Hüllenrachen resided. Knowing his studious habits, he had hoped to see his light still burning, nor was he disappointed. He contrived to bring him to his window, and a moment after the door was cautiously opened. Why, Lottchen, where do you come from? From the grave, Heinrich, or next door to it. Come in and tell me all about it. We thought the old painter had made a model of you and tortured you to death. Perhaps you were not far wrong. 
but get me a horn of ale for even a vampire is thirsty you know a vampire exclaimed heinrich retreating a pace and involuntarily putting himself upon his guard karl laughed my hand was warm was it not old fellow he said vampires are cold all but the blood what a fool i am rejoined heinrich but you know we have been hearing such horrors lately that a fellow may be excused for shuddering a little when a pale-faced apparition tells him at two o'clock in the morning that he is a vampire and thirsty too karl told him the whole story and the mental process of regarding it for the sake of telling it revealed to him pretty clearly some of the treatment of which he had been unconscious at the time heinrich was quite sure that his suspicions were correct and now the question was what was to be done next at all events said heinrich we must keep you out of the way for some time i will represent to my landlady that you are in hiding from enemies and her heart will rule her tongue she can let you have a garret room i know and i will do as well as i can to bear you company we shall have time then to invent some plan of operation to this proposal karl agreed with hearty thanks and soon all was arranged the only conclusion they could yet arrive at was that somehow or other the old demon painter must be tamed meantime how fared it with lilith she too had no doubt that she had seen the body ghost of poor karl and that the vampire had according to rule paid her the first visit because he loved her best this was horrible enough if the vampire were not really the person he represented but if in any sense it were karl himself at least it gave some expectation of a more prolonged existence than her father had taught her to look for and if love anything like her mother's still lasted even along with the habits of a vampire then there was something to hope for in the future and then though he had visited her he had not as far as she was aware deprived her of a drop of blood she could not be certain that he had not bitten her for she had been in such a strange condition of mind that she might not have felt it but she believed that he had restrained the impulses of his vampire nature and had left her lest he should yet yield to them she fell fast asleep and when morning came there was not as far as she could judge one of those triangular leech-like perforations to be found upon her whole body will it be believed that the moment she was satisfied of this she was seized by a terrible jealousy lest karl should have gone and bitten someone else most people will wonder that she should not have gone out of her senses at once but there was all the difference between a visit from a real vampire and a visit from a man she had begun to love even although she took him for a vampire all the difference does not lie in a name they were very different causes and the effects must be very different when Teufelsburst came down in the morning, he crept into the studio like a murderer. There lay the awful white block, seeming to his eyes just the same as he had left it. What was to be done with it? He dared not open it. Mold and model must go together. But whither? If inquiry should be made after Wolkenlicht, and this were discovered anywhere on his premises, would it not be enough to bring him at once to the gallows? Therefore it would be dangerous to bury it in the garden, or in the cellar besides thought he with a shudder that would be to fix the vampire as a guest forever and the horrors of the past night rushed back upon his imagination with renewed intensity what would it be to have the dead karl crawling about his house forever now inside now out now sitting on the stairs now staring in at the windows he would have dragged it to the bottom of his garden past which the moldau flowed and plunged it into the stream but then should the spectre continue to prove troublesome it would be almost impossible to reach the body so as to destroy it by fire besides which he could not do it without assistance and the probability of discovery if however the apparition should turn out to be no vampire but only a respectable ghost they might manage to endure its presence till it should be weary of haunting them he resolved at last to convey the body for the meantime into a concealed cellar in the house seeing something must be done before his daughter came down Proceeding to remove it, his consternation as greatly increased when he discovered how the body had grown in weight since he had thus disposed of it, leaving on his mind scarcely a hope that it could turn out not to be a vampire after all. He could scarcely stir it, and there was but one whom he could call to his assistance, the old woman who acted as his housekeeper and servant. He went to her room, roused her, and told her the whole story. Devoted to her master for many years, and not quite so sensitive to fearful influences, as when less experienced in horrors 
she showed immediate readiness to render him assistance. Utterly unable, however, to lift the mass between them, they could only drag and push it along, and such a slow toil was it that there was no time to remove the traces of its track before Lilith came down and saw a broad white line leading from the door of the studio down the cellar stairs. She knew in a moment what it meant, but not a word was uttered about the matter, and the name of Karl Wolkenlicht seemed to be entirely forgotten. But how could the affairs of a house go on all the same when every one of the household knew that a dead body lay in the cellar, nay more, that, although it lay still and dead enough all day, it would come half alive at nightfall, and, turning the whole house into a sepulchre by its presence, go creeping about like a cat all over it in the dark, perhaps with phosphorescent eyes? So it was not surprising that the painter abandoned his studio early, and that the three found themselves together in the gorgeous room formerly described as soon as twilight began to fall. Already Teufelsborst had begun to experience a kind of shrinking from the horrid faces in his own pictures, and to feel disgusted at the abortions of his own mind. But all that he and the old woman now felt was an increasing fear as the night drew on, a kind of sickening and paralyzing terror. The thing down there would not lie quiet, at least its phantom in the cellars of their imagination would not. As much as possible, however, they avoided alarming Lilith, who, knowing all they knew, was as silent as they. But her mind was in a strange state of excitement, partly from the presence of a new sense of love, the pleasure of which all the atmosphere of grief into which it grew could not totally quench. It comforted her, somehow, as a child may comfort when his father is away. Bedtime came, and no one made a move to go. Without a word spoken on the subject, the three remained together all night the elders nodding and slumbering occasionally, and Lilith getting some share of repose on a couch. All night the shape of death might be somewhere about the house, but it did not disturb them. They heard no sound, saw no sight, and when the morning dawned they separated, chilled and stupid, and for the time beyond fear, to seek repose in their private chambers. There they remained equally undisturbed. But when the painter approached his easel a few hours after, looking more pale and haggard still than he was wont, from the fears of the night, a new bewilderment took possession of him. He had been busy with a fresh embodiment of his favorite subject, into which he had sketched the form of the student as the sufferer. He had represented poor Wolkenlicht as just beginning to recover from a trance, while a group of surgeons, unaware of the signs of returning life, were absorbed in a minute dissection of one of the limbs. At an open door he had painted Lilith passing, with her face buried in a bunch of sweet peas. But when he came to the picture, he found, to his astonishment and terror, that the face of one of the group was now turned towards that of the victim, regarding his revival with demoniac satisfaction, and taking pains to prevent the others from discovering it. The face of this prince of torturers was that of Teufelsborst himself. Lilith had altogether vanished, and in her place stood the dim vampire reiteration of the body that lay extended on the table staring greedily at the assembled company. With trembling hands the painter removed the picture from the easel and turned its face to the wall. Of course this was the work of Lottchen. When he left the house he took with him the key of a small private door which was so seldom used that, while it remained closed, the key would not be missed, perhaps for many months. Watching the windows he had chosen a safe time to enter, and had been hard at work all night on these alterations. Teufelsborst attributed them to the vampire and left the picture as he found it, not daring to put brush to it again. The next night was passed, much after the same fashion, but the fear had begun to die away a little in the hearts of the women, who did not know what had taken place in the studio on the previous night. It burrowed, however, with gathered force in the vitals of Teufelsborst, but this night likewise passed in peace, and before it was over, the old woman had taken to speculating in her own mind as to the best way of disposing of the body, seeing it was not at all likely to be troublesome. But when the painter entered his studio in trepidation the next morning, he found that the form of the lovely Lilith was painted out of every picture in the room. This could not be concealed, and Lilith and the servant became aware that the studio was the portion of the house in haunting which the vampire left the rest in peace. Karl recounted all the tricks he had played to his friend Heinrich, who begged to be allowed to bear him company the following night. To this Karl consented, 
thinking that it would be considerably more agreeable to have a companion. So they took a couple of bottles of wine and some provisions with them, and before midnight found themselves snug in the studio. They sat very quiet for some time, for they knew that if they were seen, two vampires would not be so terrible as one, and might occasion discovery. But at length Heinrich could bear it no longer. "'I say, Lottchen, let's go and have a look, for your dead body. What has the old beggar done with it?' I think I know. Stop, let me peep out. All right, come along. With a lamp in his hand, he led the way to the cellars, and after searching about a little, they discovered it. It looks horrid enough, said Heinrich, but think a drop or two of wine would brighten it up a little. So he took a bottle from his pocket, and after they had had a glass apiece, he dropped a third in blots all over the plaster. Being red wine, it had the effect Hullenrocken desired. When they visit it next, they will know that the vampire can find the food he prefers, said he. In a corner close by the plaster, they found the clothes Karl had worn. Hello, said Heinrich. We'll make something of this find. So he carried them with him to the studio. There he got hold of a lay figure. What are you about, Heinrich? Going to make a scarecrow to keep the ravens off old Teufel's pictures, answered Heinrich as he went on dressing the lay figure in Karl's clothes. He next seated the creature at an easel with its back to the door, so that it should be the first thing the painter should see when he entered. Karl meant to remove this before he went, for it was too comical to fall in with the rest of his proceedings, but the two sat down to their supper, and by the time they had finished the wine, they thought they should like to go to bed. So they got up and went home, and Karl forgot the lay figure, leaving it in busy motionlessness all night before the easel. When Teufelsburst saw it, he turned and fled with a cry that brought his daughter to his help. He rushed past her, able only to articulate, The vampire! The vampire! Painting! Far more courageous than he, because her conscience was more peaceful, Lilith passed on to the studio. She too recoiled a step or two when she saw the figure, but with the sight of the back of Karl, as she supposed it to be, came the longing to see the face that was on the other side so she crept round and round by the wall, as far off as she could. The figure remained motionless. It was a strange kind of shock that she experienced when she saw the face, disgusting from its inanity. The absurdity next struck her, and with the absurdity flashed into her mind the conviction that this was not the doing of a vampire, for of all creatures under the moon he could not be expected to be a humorist. A wild hope sprang up in her mind that Karl was not dead. Of this she soon resolved to make herself sure. She closed the door of the studio, in the strength of her new hope undressed the figure, put it in its place, concealed the garments, all the work of a few minutes, and then, finding her father just recovering from the worst of his fear, told him there was nothing in the studio but what ought to be there, and persuaded him to go and see. He not only saw no one, but found that no further liberties had been taken with his pictures. Reassured, he soon persuaded himself that the spectre in this case had been the offspring of his own terror-haunted brain. But he had no spirit for painting now. He wandered about the house, himself haunting it like a restless ghost. When night came, Lilith retired to her own room. The waters of fear had begun to subside in the house, but the painter and his old attendant did not yet follow her example. As soon, however, as the house was quite still, Lilith glided noiselessly down the stairs, went into the studio, where as yet there assuredly was no vampire, and concealed herself in a corner. As it would not do for an earnest student like Heinrich to be away from his work very often, he had not asked to accompany Lottchen this time. And indeed Karl himself, a little anxious about the result of the scarecrow, greatly preferred going alone. While she was waiting for what might happen, the conviction grew upon Lilith, as she reviewed all the past of the story, that these phenomena were the work of the real Karl, and of no vampire. In a few moments she was still more sure of this. Behind the screen where she had taken refuge hung one of the pictures out of which her portrait had been painted the night before last. She had taken a lamp with her in the studio, with the intention of extinguishing it the moment she heard any sign of approach. But as the vampire lingered, she began to occupy herself with examining the picture beside her. She had not looked at it long before she wetted the tip of her forefinger and began to rub away at the obliteration. Her suspicions were instantly confirmed. The substance employed was only a gummy wash over the paint. 
the delight she experienced at the discovery threw her into a mischievous humor. I will see, she said to herself, whether I cannot match Karl Wolkenlicht at this game. In a closet in the room hung a number of costumes, which Lilith had at different times worn for her father. Among them was a large white drapery, which she easily disposed as a shroud. With the help of some chalk, she soon made herself ghastly enough, and then placing her lamp on the floor behind the screen, and setting a chair over it, so that it should throw no light in any direction, she waited once more for the vampire. Nor had she much longer to wait. She soon heard a door move, the sound of which she hardly knew, and then the studio door opened. Her heart beat dreadfully, not with fear lest it should be a vampire after all, but with hope that it was Carl. To see him once more was too great joy. Would she not make up to him for all her coldness? But would he care for her now? Perhaps he had been quite cured of his longing for a hard heart like hers. She peeped. It was he, sure enough, looking as handsome as ever. He was holding his light to look at her last work, and the expression of his face, even in regarding her handiwork, was enough to let her know that he loved her still. If she had not seen this, she dared not have shown herself from her hiding place. Taking the lamp in her hand, she got upon the chair and looked over the screen, letting the light shine from below her face. She then made a slight noise to attract Carl's attention. He looked up, evidently rather startled, and saw the face of Lilith in the air. He gave a stifled cry, threw himself on his knees with his arms stretched towards her, and moaned, I have killed her! I have killed her! Lilith descended and approached him noiselessly. He did not move. She came close to him and said, are you Karl Wolkenlicht? His lips moved, but no sound came. If you are a vampire, and I am a ghost, she said, but a low, happy laugh alone concluded the sentence. Karl sprang to his feet. Lilith's laugh changed into a burst of sobbing and weeping, and in another moment the ghost was in the arms of the vampire. Lilith had no idea how far her father had wronged Carl, and though, from thinking over the past, he had no doubt that the painter had drugged him, he did not wish to pain her by imparting this conviction. But Lilith was afraid of a reaction of rage and hatred in her father after the terror was removed, and Carl saw that he might thus be deprived of all further intercourse with Lilith, and all chance of softening the old man's heart towards him while Lilith would not hear of forsaking him who had banished all the human race but herself. They managed at length to agree upon a plan of operation. The first thing they did was to go to the cellar where the plaster mass lay, Carl carrying with him a great axe used for cleaving wood. Lilith shuddered when she saw it, stained as it was with the wine Heinrich had spilt over it, and almost believed herself the midnight companion of a vampire after all visiting with him the terrible corpse in which he lived all day. But Carl soon reassured her, and a few good blows of the axe revealed a very different core to that which Teufelsburst supposed to be in it. Carl broke it into pieces, and, with Lilith's help, who insisted on carrying her share, the hole was soon at the bottom of the Moldau, and every trace of its ever having existed removed. Before morning, too, the form of Lilith had dawned anew in every picture, there was no time to restore to its former condition the one Karl had first altered, for in it the changes were all that they had seemed, nor indeed was he capable of restoring it in the master's style, but they put it quite out of the way, and hoped that sufficient time might elapse before the painter thought of it again. When they had done, and Lilith, for all his entreaties, would remain with him no longer, Karl took his former clothes with him, and, having spent the rest of the night in his old room, dressed in them in the morning. When Teufelsburst entered his studio the next day, there sat Karl, as if nothing had happened, finishing the drawing at which he had been at work when the fit of insensibility came upon him. The painter started, stared, rubbed his eyes, thought it was another spectral illusion, and was on the point of yielding to his terror when Karl rose and approached him with a smile. The healthy, sunshiny countenance of Karl, let him be ghost or goblin, could not fail to produce somewhat of a tranquilizing effect on Teufelsburst. He took his offered hand mechanically, 
his countenance utterly vacant with idiotic bewilderment. Carl said, I was not well, and thought it better to pay a visit to a friend for a few days, but I shall soon make up for lost time, for I am all right now. He sat down at once, taking no notice of his master's behavior, and went on with his drawing. Teufelsburst stood staring at him for some minutes without moving, then suddenly turned and left the room. Carl heard him hurrying down the cellar stairs. In a few moments he came up again. Carl stole a glance at him. There he stood in the same spot, no doubt more full of bewilderment than ever, but it was not possible that his face should express more. At last he went to his easel and sat down with a long-drawn sigh as if of relief. But, though he sat at his easel, he painted none that day, and as often as Carl ventured a glance, he saw him still staring at him. The discovery that his pictures were restored to their former condition aided, no doubt, in leading him to the same conclusion as the other facts, whatever that conclusion might be, probably that he had been the sport of some evil power, and had been for the greater part of a week utterly bewitched. Lilith had taken care to instruct the old woman, with whom she was all-powerful and as neither of them showed the smallest traces of astonishment which seemed to be slowly vitrifying his own brain he was at last perfectly satisfied that things had been going on all right everywhere but in his inner man and in this conclusion he was certainly not far wrong in more senses than one but when all was restored again to the old routine it became evident that the peculiar direction of his art in which he had hitherto indulged had ceased to interest him the shock had acted chiefly upon that part of his mental being which had been so absorbed. He would sit for hours without doing anything, apparently plunged in meditation. Several weeks elapsed without any change, and both Lilith and Carl were getting dreadfully anxious about him. Carl paid him every attention, and the old man, for he now looked much older than before, submitted to receive his services as well as those of Lilith. At length, one morning, he said in a slow, thoughtful tone, Carl Wolkenlicht, I should like to paint you. Certainly, sir, answered Carl, jumping up. Well, where would you like me to sit? So the ice of silence and inactivity was broken, and the painter drew and painted, and the spring of his art flowed once more, and he made a beautiful portrait of Carl, a portrait without evil or suffering and as soon as he had finished Carl, he began once more to paint Lilith. And when he had painted her, he composed a picture for the very purpose of introducing them together. And in this picture there was neither ugliness nor torture, but human feeling and human hope instead. Then Carl knew that he might speak to him of Lilith, and he spoke, and was heard with a smile. But he did not dare to tell the truth of the vampire story, till one day that Teufelsborst was lying on the floor of a room in Karl's ancestral castle, half smothered in grandchildren, when the only answer it drew from the old man was a kind of shuddering laugh, and the words, Don't speak of it, Karl, my boy. End of The Cruel Painter by George MacDonald